I was born south of the Missouri River. Those north of the Missouri River call it Missouri. But south of the Missouri River, it's Missouri. <laughs> and that's the way to say it. <laughs> so I grew up with that song, I'll Fly Away. I want to share with you from the Word of God today a sermon that I'm calling Positive Principles for a Powerful New Year. And I'm going to stay on this subject probably for the next three to four weeks, just giving you other positive principles for a powerful new year. And it, the message primarily applies to the church. We want our church to be a powerful church. We want this to be a powerful new year. Somebody asked me before the service how we're doing with regard to finding a pastor. And I just said, well, I'm working hard to try to work myself out of a job. We will have our first pulpit committee meeting on Wednesday evening. And uh, we are... Uh, we have some very, uh, two or three very positive, uh, as far as my opinion is concerned. Of course, the board and the, the pulpit committee are the ones that make the decisions. But uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we have two or three very good-looking candidates. I'm not talking about their appearance. I'm just talking about their experience, their background, their capabilities, and all of that. So uh, pray for us as you meet for service Wednesday evening. We'll be meeting in the pastor's office and uh, examining these resumes and applications and looking over the qualifications and all of that. But be assured, we want to get you the right man for this place as quickly as possible. So I'm working, I'm trying to work myself out of a job. So, uh, but we don't want to work too fast because we don't want to make a mistake. We want to give it the appropriate time. My text for today is found in Acts chapter 2. Isn't this a Pentecostal church? Amen. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. These are the words of Peter on that first day of Pentecost. As they were asking, what's going on? As these Pentecostals now came out and they heard them all speaking in other tongues and in different languages and some understood what they were saying. And it was Peter who stepped forward. He was the forward one. Probably one of the most unlikely to be the forward one. But nevertheless, he was prompted by the Spirit to step forward. And he, in his opening remarks, makes some accusations. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and your children, and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God shall call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now that was a Pentecostal meeting. And there are some who would say to you that that 
outpouring of the Holy Spirit was only for the establishment of the New Testament church. But it is not for us today to speak in other tongues as they did on the day of Pentecost. But when I come to those who tell me that, I point them back to Peter's first sermon. The promise is for you. All of those present, your children, future generations, and for all who are afar off, those who could not be there on the day of Pentecost, but those from around the world, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. We do not come to Jesus until we are called by the power and conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when he reveals himself to us and we come to him and we have that encounter by our faith and receive him as our Savior, it's because he called us to himself. Jesus is the head and builder of the church. And he did not make a mistake in the way he built it. We have a blueprint of what he did in the form of the vital growing church of Acts chapter 2, which was born through prayer and with the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the strongest doctoral cases for the Spirit empowered is the call to carry out the transformative mission that God had for the church. Both unchurched people and stagnant and un inspired believers can be united, rejuvenated, saved, and brought into the fellowship. And the Spirit's power is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise that those who believe in Him would do the same works as He did and even greater. You are probably aware of the fact that I've dedicated my life to the ministry and the building of the Church of Jesus Christ. Not, lo not just locally, but through the lives of ministers who have sought to discover the principles that guide growth and success. Since Bible college days, I've spent my life in full-time ministry. Even when I took a group of people to pioneer a church with 12 families starting out, I determined that I would not take a secular job. That I would be supported by the church and live by what they were able to give me. And in three years, that church was flourishing and set in order as a full-fledged general council church. All by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God has been faithful to me. And God's people who have supported me have been faithful. And at this point in my life, I am happy for the opportunity to continue to sow into the lives of others and to assist the work of God in every way that I possibly can. If we are to see enduring growth and success in the strength the principles that motivate us must be based upon the Word of God. They must be based upon biblical foundations. And these principles are what I want to share with you. And principle number one is, we must be a penitent church. That means we must believe that God can redeem those who are lost. We must also recognize that we must give of ourselves and repent of our sins and our shortcomings, for there are none of us that are perfect. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, when they asked, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the foundations of the New Testament church is built upon the premise 
that we begin with a fellowship of people who have a personal encounter with the living Lord. That personal encounter is the only thing that can transform your life and my life. You say, preacher, what are you talking about a personal encounter? That means that Jesus revealing himself to you and that you become penitent or repentant of all of your sins and receiving him as your savior. That is an encounter and it's an encounter that you will remember. I will tell you that I was saved as a boy in my dad's church. I was only about eight years of age when I answered the altar call and came and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now at eight years of age, how big a sinner could you have been? Probably a few lies here or there. And a little misbehavior now and then. But nevertheless, I recognized that I needed an encounter with Jesus and I came to the altar and confessed my sins. I know exactly when it took place. I, I was communicating, communicating with some missionaries in France and the French people did not believe that children could be saved, they could, that they could have that relationship with Jesus. And when I gave my testimony, he said, I want you to put that in writing for me so that I can share it. So at the age of eight, I was saved. At the age of nine, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So I'm here to tell you, children can come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and it can be a transforming power in their own lives that will last them for all of their life because it's an experience you won't forget. Amen. I believe in a strong children's ministry in the church. The first quality for a powerful church is that we are a praying church. It is impossible to have a strong church without leadership that has been born again and it is a praying leadership because we live in a hurting world and the only way we can be successful is to be led by spiritual people. The Apostle Paul said for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now please don't misunderstand me. I feel that there's a vast difference between the church, those that we call the called out ones, and those that are just in attendance at the church that we commonly call the church meeting. This is because if that is the case, if there are those who are not particularly non-believers, but just haven't had the encounter that they need with Jesus Christ, if they should be in the church also. Because how are they going to come to know the Lord without the receiving of the word. And it is by the receiving of the word that the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes and that people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But if the church has been in action in the community, touching the lives of the non-believer or the unsaved, then how are they going to come into our meeting? And every time we meet, there should be those who need to have the encounter with Jesus in our midst. This will become a reality if we're having the kind of influence in our community that we need. We need to be influencing at least one person every week to bring with us to church. I pastored First Assembly of God in Clearwater for 13 years. And during that time, we had a custom like you that on the first Sunday of every month, we took communion. And on the first Sunday night of every month, 
We had baptismal service. We had it in the regular service. And I, there were only a few Sundays that I can remember when we did not have people to be baptized in that baptistry. Now, I didn't do the baptizing. The staff did the baptizing. The children's pastor baptized the children. And the youth pastor baptized the youth. And I conducted the service while the baptism was going on and they were being introduced and being baptized. It was a great time. But it was because of the influence of the congregation that brought people in to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Talking about influence, i got to tell you a little something about my home church. Superman Town, Metropolis, Illinois. Did you know that Metropolis, Illinois is the only town named Metropolis? And if you visit Metropolis, Illinois, there is a huge statue of Superman in the public square. That's where I grew up, in Superman town. But the town has decreased in, a popula in population over the years, when I was growing up, it was a population of ten to 12,000 people. Now its population is about 5,000. They have a beautiful church there, wonderful congregation. But I preached there a few months ago. Well, you know, it's been a couple of years ago. And we visited there often because Beverly's mother is still living and is a charter member of that church from the time it was established. She's now almost 95 years old. She'll be 95 in February. Beverly has to go up once every two months and spend two weeks to relieve her brother who is her continual caregiver. Her brother is 12 years younger than Beverly and he's still able and capable of taking care of that. But it's so confining that he has to have relief. So I become a bachelor for two weeks every month. <laughs> But I preached in that church a couple of years ago and it seemed to me that it was a dying church. In fact, after their pastor left, it took them six months to get a pastor. And I prayed with them, Lord, send the right man to this place. And they did get the right man. When Mark Russell landed in Metropolis, began pastoring that church, he started immediately interacting with the community. He visited every place of business and introduced himself to the business owner saying, I am the new pastor at Lighthouse Assembly of God on Airport Road. They got to know him. He's, now, he's been there now two years and he's well known in the town. And if I've ever seen a church come alive, that church has come alive. People are involved. And I, the last time I was there, which has only now been a few months ago, the house was full and people worshiping and praising God. So I'm here to tell you that God can even resurrect a dead church. And by the way, this church is a long way from being dead. We're alive and well. Hallelujah. To make this sermon really understandable, I've got to share with you another story. There's a couple by the name of Terry and Diane Thomas who are pastoring in Palm Coast. Florida have been there for a few years now. They have two beautiful daughters. Then those daughters recently moved to Nashville and they are recording artists and doing a wonderful job. When I first met Terry and Diane Thomas, it was through Diane's brother, whose name was Mike Baskovich. And he was the manager of his father's restaurant, New Orleans restaurant, on Gulf to Bay Boulevard in Clearwater. 
I often went in there and I often talked to the manager. In fact, I, I wanted a salad dressing that they, didn't, they were not using. I wanted honey mustard dressing. And uh, I asked to talk to the manager. That's when I first met Mike. Mike said, I'll get you some, some dressing. And from then on, they always had the honey mustard dressing. But often when I would go in there and he found out he was, he was his father was Greek. They're a Greek family. His father had been involved in the building of that Greek church there on Gulf of Bay Boulevard. So they were about devout Greeks. But Mike became very curious. And when I would go in to eat, which we did quite often, Mike would come and sit down with me in the booth and start asking me questions about the Bible and about the Lord. And we shared together. And he came to church. And then he started going with a young lady he was single, going with a young lady, and uh, they started coming to church. And I married them in a traditional Greek wedding. <laughs> but Diane and Terry Thomas, that was Mike's sister. Mike had accepted the Lord, and his, his wife had accepted the Lord. They were coming to the church. So Terry and Diane started coming to the church also. But now, they were nightclub entertainers. And they had their, they entertained in various places, but at this particular time, they were entertaining at the bar at San Key Hotel on Clearwater Beach. But they came to know the Lord as their Savior. But they didn't stop entertaining. And one day I met them after church on a Sunday morning and... Uh, and, I, and Diane said to me, Pastor, we don't close our show till about 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, but we always close our show by inviting those that are still around to join us at First Assembly of God on Sunday, for, for Sunday morning. And I said, well, have any of them come yet? Well, no, she said, I haven't seen any of them. And I said, well, I'm curious. What kind of a show do you do? And uh, she said, well, I do. I have about a half dozen costume changes during the show. We, do the, we have our band. And I do singing imitations. I said, who do you imitate? She said, oh, I do Dolly Parton. I do Cher. And she named off three or four female, popular female singers of the time. And I said to her, well, you know, you're there every Saturday night, right? Oh, yeah, we're there every Saturday night. Well, I said, Beverly and I may just drop in on you sometime because I'd just kind of like to see the show that you're doing. And there looked like a panic look in her face. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, Pastor. I don't want anybody to see my pastor at that bar in the show that I'm doing. And I said, well, you're doing it every Saturday night. What would be wrong with me just slipping in? I promise I won't drink. <laughs> oh, no, she said, Pastor, don't do that. And from that point, she and Terry began to say, you know, if we're in a place that we can't even be comfortable of our pastor coming, we're in the wrong place. We need to stop this. So they stopped their entertaining and joined the choir. <laughs> and from that point, began to study the Bible, and Terry took the Berean Bible course we got, got his credentials to preach, and for a number of years now they've been pastoring at Palm Coast, Florida. So that's the influence that the church can have even on the business community if we will involve ourselves and do it. 
So the church is not just for the redeemed, but the leadership of the church must be redeemed and spirit-filled. It's abundantly clear in the formation of the New Testament church that influence, connections, political positions did not matter. But every decision of the leadership had to be carefully prayed about. And the affirmation of the Holy Spirit was seriously sought. And there was not, it was not a popularity contest. Did you know that sometimes when there is a church with significant growth, there are other churches that are kind of stagnant, not doing anything? And they accuse the church that is growing significantly of being soft on sin. Well, that's the reason they're getting all those people in there. They, uh, there's no spirit there. There's no conviction there. And, and uh, they're soft on sin. No, that's not the case. You still preach the word. And people should be welcome to the church. Did you know that the church is more than just a haven for the saints? It's an emergency room for the unsaved. It's an emergency room for those that are burdened with habits. It's an emergency room of those who need to connect with a higher power. It's an emergency room for those who need spiritual healing. That's the church that God wants us to be. Not just a haven for the saints, but an emergency room for the sinner. Well, I am down to my second point. And I saw the clock. It's time to bring it to a close. But I want you to stand with me. Jonathan, come to the piano. This is a good point to close all. I'll start there next week. <laughs> I told you this was going to be a continuing message. <laughs> 